in shadow or sunshine or rain. The Lord I know ruleth for everything, and all of my worry is vain. Living by faith, yes, living by faith, in Jesus above, in Jesus above, trusting and Stand, we'll sing page number 164, Nothing But the Blood, page 164. And on the second verse, as the choir comes down, if you'll turn around, greet someone this evening. And also, there's an offering in the back. If you have some offering you'd like to drop off, it, the offering plates are there in the back. Page 164. Oh, what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Turn around and greet someone this evening. last. This is all my hope and peace, nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my righteousness, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. the blood of Jesus. You may
You may be seated. We're going to sing another song as you let you sit down for this one. Page 354, Look to the Lamb of God. Page 354. If you from sin are longing to be free, look to the Lamb of God. He to redeem you died on Calvary. Look to the Lamb of God. Look to the Lamb of God. Look to the Lamb of God. For He alone is able to save you. Look to the Lamb of God. When Satan tempts and doubts and fears assail, look to the Lamb of God. Brother Stephen, I thought maybe you left the room. I didn't see you. Amen. You come up and get ready. Brother uh, Dowdy is going to sing for us. And uh, I was thinking that maybe Stephen had stepped out, still working on the message. And Hannah Kratzer has come back with us for her spring break. And uh, that's how welcome you all make her feel. Amen. So she's come back for most of the week with us. We're trying to talk her into staying through RU. But uh, I told her earlier, I said, hey, preacher's gone today. You know, you want to preach tonight? She goes, sure. <laughs> She's up for it. So if Stephen kind of falters, you know, and any little bit, we'll just take Shepherd's hook, pull him off, put Hannah up here. Amen. All right, Brother Dowdy. see this world, dear Lord, as though I were looking through your eyes. A world of men who don't want you, Lord, but a world the way you see I 
just know I'd serve you more faithfully. Let me see this world, dear Lord, through your eyes when men mocked your holy name. When they cursed you and spat upon you, Lord, let me love them as you loved them just the same. Help me put aside my petty problems and grief for men hell bound eternally. For if once I could see this world the way you see, I just know I'd serve you more faithfully. For if once I could see this world the way you see, I just know I'd serve you more faithfully. All right, Brother Stephen's going to come and preach. And uh, Stephen, I appreciate you. Amen. That there was a time when our children were small, and uh, I worked a full-time job, and we still had multiple jobs within the church multiple things that we did and, and we taught and we were youth group leaders and it's a heavy responsibility you people know this you're here you're the Wednesday crowd you're the Sunday evening crowd you're probably here for family school hour as well and uh, you know all that the wiremans do around here and uh, I know what this family does for this church and just the the work that goes into it the studying the constant preparing the teaching that he does for um, TFM and brother Stephen is is a He's a good, good man. He reminds me a lot of me, only a whole lot smarter. And uh, I could have used some of that when I was your age. But God bless you, brother. We love you. Amen. He has better hair. He has better hair than I do. Thank you, Pastor Jerry. Honestly, most of that credit goes to my wife. She writes all my lessons and sermons, and so nothing that I do. But we're thankful to be part of this church. Thank you for the, thankful for the opportunity that God's given us here. Um, my my kids get sad when we're not at church all day on Sunday. Um, today, my wife had to go home to make some lunch, and the kids asked to stay for an extra three hours until she came back. And I, I'm glad that my kids have grown up around you people. I'm glad for the influence that you guys have had, and I'm, I'm just very thankful for it. So, um, Pastor Jerry said, made a comment about how I have a, you know, quite the, quite the follow-up to... Uh, Brother Leonard's, and I had several people make comments to me about, well, make sure I have a better joke than his. And so, <clears throat> after much Googling, I found a joke that explains why I don't tell jokes. Okay? So a preacher, uh, who we shall say was humor-inspired, attended a conference to help encourage and better equip pastors uh, for their church services and their ministries. Among the spe speakers were many well-known and dynamic speakers. Uh, one such speaker boldly approached the pulpit, gathered the entire crowd's attention, and said, the best years of my life were spent in the arms of a woman that wasn't my wife. The crowd was shocked. He followed up by saying, and that woman was my mother. The crowd burst into laughter and, delivered, and he delivered the rest of the speech and went quite well. Well, one of the pastors that was in the conference said, I'm going to use that this Sunday. That's a good one. And so, uh, as he approached the pulpit that Sunday morning, he tried to rehearse this joke in his head, but it suddenly became a bit foggy. Getting to the microphone, he said loudly, the greatest years of my life were spent in the arms of another woman that was not my wife. The congregation inhaled half the air in the room. After standing there for almost 10 seconds in stunned silence, trying to recall the second half of the joke, the pastor finally said, I can't remember who it was. 
So that is why I don't tell jokes, because something like that would happen to me. But all right, so let's 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 get into this now. Uh, so we're going to be in uh, First Samuel chapter nine. Go ahead and open your Bibles to that. First Samuel chapter number nine. Um, let's go ahead and pray first, and then we'll ask God's blessing on the service and go from there. Father, we love you so much. God, I thank you for the opportunity to to be up here presenting your word. Uh, please, please help me. Give me the, the words to say. Give me the strength. Lord, I pray that you would, you would take over this service. Pray that your Holy Spirit would move, uh, soften hearts, Lord. Uh, convict, uh, convict me in my life. Lord, I love you, and I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm very thankful for the opportunity Pastor has given me to, to preach to you this evening and um, share what, what I have from the Word of God, what God's laid on my heart, and uh, we'll see how it goes. So 1 Samuel chapter number 9, where we're at here is... Saul first comes on the scene, um, the first time he's really mentioned in the book of 1 Samuel. Uh, right before this, the people said, give us a king. Uh, it was after Samuel went to have his sons take over his position as, uh, I guess if you look in chapter number 8, actually, we can get a little context here. Uh, chapter 8, verse number 1, and it came to pass when Samuel was old that he made his sons judges over Israel. Now, the name of his firstborn was Joel, and the second was um, Abiah, and they were judges in Beersheba, um, uh, Beersheba. And his sons walked not in his ways, but turned aside after lucre and took bribes and perverted judgments. Um, long story short, all the people come together and say, we, we don't want your sons. Your sons are not godly men. Give us a king. Samuel has a hard time with this. Uh, God tells him, they did not reject you, Samuel, but they have rejected me. And so give them a king. And Samuel goes through and tells them what their king is going to do. Uh, take their, their sons, their daughters, all these different things. And finally, God, and God says, give it to them, and Samuel does. And so that's where Saul comes on the scene here. Obviously, he's not king yet. Uh, this is actually just giving a little bit of background to Saul. But we'll start in chapter 9, verse number 1. Now, there's a man of Benjamin whose name was Kish, the son of Abiel, the son of Zeror, the son of Bekoroth, the son of Aphia, a Benjamite, a mighty man of power. And he had a son whose name was Saul, a choice young man and a goodly. And there was not among the children of Israel a goodlier person than he. From his soldiers and upward, he was higher than any of the people. And the asses of Kish, Saul's father, were lost. And Kish said unto Saul, his son, take now one of the servants with thee, and arise and go seek the asses. We're going to get further in this passage, but I want to stop here for a second. So this, this journey that Paul's about to take, Paul, um, sorry, I'm going to say Paul and Saul 30 times, and I, I mix them up. I'm sorry if I do. If I say Paul, I mean Saul. And if I say Saul, I mean Saul. Um, so this journey that Saul's going to take is from looking at it on the surface, it seems like a very simple, trivial journey. He's... He's going to look for some donkeys. This is really, I mean, it's servant's work. He, he sent a servant, his father said, hey, take a servant and go, go find the donkeys. Um, but this journey was going to change Paul's life, or Saul, I already did it. This journey was going to change Saul's life forever. I think that when we're looking for God's will in our life, we, we want this big picture, this shining light, this your life is going to consist of this, and you're going to do this for God, and you're going to have this big name, and you're going to do this and this. Well, guess what? Saul was going to become a very big name, but he didn't start like that. He started with simple obedience. Uh, we've, said, we've heard it said many times, you find God's will by doing God's will. I think it's something to be said for obedience. Now, if you go back to um, Josiah, uh, the king of Israel, one of the good kings. When he first turned eight years old, it said he, he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. He, he followed the law. He, he obeyed the scriptures. He did what was right. And he ended up becoming a very influential king of Israel, all from starting with obedience. And here Saul, going to be the first king of Israel, starts with simple obedience to his father. So I find it very curious that the man of God that was going to be the king of Israel performed very simple obedience when he was asked. He did the, job, the same job as a servant. He didn't, he didn't complain about it. He simply obeyed. I think sometimes that we think we can be too good 
to simply obey. Um, we always have a better way, right? We, we, we're asked to do something, or God shows us to do something simple in his scripture, and, well, God, we could do that, but if we do this, it's going to be much more effective. God says, my word's preserved and perfect, and make sure we use the right Bible. Well, if we use an easier one that people can read, we might have better success. Uh, well, God says, you sing songs, hymns, and spiritual songs. Well, if we, if we go a little bit more towards the worldly music, we might have a little more success, rather than just simple obedience. And that can apply for the church, but what about our own, own lives? We know that there are some things that God wants us to do, regardless of what we're going to be, whether if we're going to be a, a pastor, pastor's wife, a missionary, um, a, a layman in the church, a deacon, a Sunday school teacher, no matter what we're going to, going to be in with our life, God has some expectations and desires from each and every one of us that, that really are the same. A couple of those, his desire is for us to attend church, fellowship together. Well, we, we know this. So Hebrews 10.25 says, Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approach it. Church attendance is a big deal. Um, obviously, we, we, we have this um, COVID-19 situation going on, and there are some people that really just shouldn't be at church. Their health doesn't allow it, and, and we want them to stay home. We don't want, we don't want anybody to get sick and and, um, and get injured due to, you know, carelessness. But I feel like there's a whole lot that are taking advantage of the pandemic. Um, this showed us that there, it doesn't take a whole lot to not want to come to church. It, takes, it doesn't take a whole lot to find an excuse to not show up. Um, I mean, don't get me wrong. Sitting at home on the couch with the coffee next to me in my recliner with the feet up, it's kind of nice watching service, but you don't get this. You don't, you don't get the fellowship. Uh, so Brother Marwelli was very influential in my life, and he always says the health of a church is shown after the preaching. What he meant by that is at, well, let's see, 7.45 when I'm done. No, I'm just kidding. You guys know I'm not long-winded. At 7 o'clock when we're done, and it's 7.10. If you look at our church, hardly anybody's left. People are here. People are fellowshipping. They're enjoying each other's company. They're encouraging each other in the Lord. They're talking about something. Today, I heard people talking about things that they read in their devotions and how it helped them and challenged them. This is fellowship that we need that is not easily obtained through live stream. Um, I think it's important that we are in church. Now, obviously, you guys are all here, so I guess I'll look at the camera and say that. I think it's important that we're in church that we're, we're attending services in order to do God's will, in order to find God's will. Another thing, we know that God desires for us to have a relationship with him, a relationship with him. We have this obviously through prayer and through scripture readings, through, through Bible reading. James 5.16 says, Confess your faults one to another and pray for one another, that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Matthew 6, 6, But thou, when thou prayest, enter in thy closet. And while thou, when thou hast shut the door, pray to thy Father, which is in secret. And thy Father, which, is, which seeth in secret, shall reward thee openly. And so a couple of simple questions just comes down to how is your prayer life? Is, is it just praying at meals? Um, I mean, that, that's a great start. But if we're going to have a relationship with our Father, if we're going to want to find God's will for our life, if he's actually going to speak to us, we're going to speak to him and converse, we need to have a strong prayer life. Um, the, I don't, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands, but uh, I don't know how many of you guys use a prayer list when you pray, but it's, I enjoy it. It keeps things organized. It keeps things structured. Obviously, when something comes in your heart, something comes in your heart. But how many of you, got, how many of you took part in the, the three days of prayer? Mo several hands, all over the room. Having all of the, the lists here and the tools made half hours go by pretty quick. It's one of those things when you want to talk to God. And you, by all means, you can just go and, you know, how you doing, Lord? And just try to have a conversation. 
But if you want to have an effectual, fervent prayer life, how it talks about in James, I would, I would recommend starting with, with a list, um, how we did during those, those three days of prayer. Uh, what about our Bible reading? Joshua 1, 8, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. So we have a lot of counsel in our life, and we're going to talk more about this here in a little bit. But when it comes to our Bible reading, and we're trying to find God's will, why would you listen to anybody else than this book? We, so, so often, we think that God's will is just this magical, you know, for, the, you know far-sought thing that we can never obtain. But it's, it's right here. I mean, we, we find God's will by doing God's will. Doing the things that he's commanded us to do in his word is going to lead to the things that he wants us to do that are, are larger things. But in our eyes, they're larger things. But in God's eyes, it's obedience. You did this. Okay, now I'm going to have you do this. Now I'm going to have you do this. Whether you're the king of Israel or whether you're going to find donkeys, God's looking for obedience. Whether you're going to be a pastor or whether you're going to clean the church every week, God's looking for obedience obedience. He's looking for faithfulness there. Um, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. It's, it's a verse that we learn as a kid, but so often we just, you know, learn it, memorize it, and then forget about it. It's in the Bible because it's true. Acknowledge him in your ways. Acknowledge what you want. Lord, help me in this area. Direct me in this path. And he said that he's going to show you his ways. And so don't just, don't, don't get complacent with scripture in that we just read it and think, well, you know, I, I remember that verse from when I was a kid. It's, it's still active. It's still effective today. So we also know that God desires us to labor for him. Now, I actually, I preached about this a couple weeks ago, talking about 1 Corinthians 15.10. It says, but by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace which bestowed upon me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Talking about laboring. God's desire is for you to be active in this church, to be active in this community for the gospel of Christ. It's not just to come and hear the preaching and not allow it to affect us and go home. He, he, he desires a change. He desires that relationship, but then he desires action based on his relationship. Okay. All right. Uh, <clears throat> we also know that God desires us to give. He desires us to give. We just had our... Um, Faith Missions, uh, Promise Garden. We, we, I, I love it. I think it's a great time. I love that my kids can get involved with it. Um, and it gives them a sense of responsibility for missions. Um, but just for giving in general. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 9, 7, Every man according as he purpose, purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity. For God loveth a cheerful giver. Now we could go to 2 Corinthians 9 and read the entire chapter and really get a good context of that. But God loves when you're happy to give. And, and if we know that God loves if we do this, I would think that we should probably try to do that. If we know that this God's will, because it makes him happy, is for us to do this, I'm going to try my best to make sure I do that because I want to find his will for my life. I, I want to know. And so I'm going to do everything that I can that I know I'm supposed to do right now. I, I knew that this morning it was God's will for me to wake up, be 40 minutes late, come to church, <laughs> no, come to church, set things up as much as I can. I, I knew that was his will for me today. Your, his will for you today, hopefully, was to do exactly what you did today. And then tomorrow, be obedient. Do the same thing. And God's going to reveal to you things. As long as you're in his word, you're praying to him, he's going to reveal larger things to you. Um, so here with, getting back to the story here, with the story of uh, Saul, Verse number three again, it says in the ass, so 1 Samuel 9, and the asses of Kish, Saul's father, were lost, and Kish said unto Saul's son, now take one of thy servants with thee, and arise, and go seek the asses. So understanding that this massive life change started for him with simple obedience. It's so important to understand that we don't need to know all of God's plan for us, but we do need to know what he has for us to do right now. We have to do that. All right, so the next thing we see in this passage, let's go ahead and keep going. Verse number four. And he passed through Mount Ephraim, passed through the land of uh, Shalisha, and they found them not. And he passed through the land of Shalim, and they, um, they were there not. 
You passed through the land of the Benjamites, but they found them not. And when they were come to... I feel like this is me looking for my shoes, by the way. You look everywhere, and my kid put them, you know, up in the attic behind an old Christmas tree. <sighs> Anyhow, sorry. They're looking all over for these donkeys, can't find them. Verse number uh, five. When they were come to the land of Zuf, Saul said to his servants that was with him, Come, let us return, lest my father leaving care for the asses and take thought for us. And so, here we have the situation of, Boaz like, all right, we've looked long enough. Let's go ahead and head back. We don't want our, our father to start coming to look. Let's take care of him. Let, let, let's, let's head back. But I see a very, a, a godly influence in Saul's life that, that changed everything. Had this servant not been here, had this servant not said this one thing, Saul would not have met Samuel that day. Let's look at verse number 6. Um, and he said unto him, so this is a servant talking to Saul, Behold, now, there is a man in this city, a man of, sorry, there is in this city a man of God, and he is an honorable man, and all that he saith cometh surely to pass. Now let us go thither, peradventure he can show us our way that we should go. Saul had a godly influence in his life, but I want you to notice who it was. It was a servant. It was a servant. We talked about this actually in TFM a little bit today. Um, being a respecter of persons. Uh, go ahead and turn over to James. James chapter 2. TFM students, this is just review. I, just, I feel like you didn't get it the first time, so one more time. James chapter 2. Verse number 1, the Bible says, My brother, and have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. For if there come into your assembly a man with a gold ring and goodly apparel, and there come in also a poor man in vile raiment, and ye have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing, and say unto him, Sit thou here in a good place, and say to the poor, Stand thou there, or sit here under my footstool. Are ye not then partial in yourselves, and are become judges of evil thoughts? Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath, God, hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom, which he hath pr uh, promised to them that love him? But ye have despised the poor. Do not rich men oppress you and draw you before the judgment seats? Do they not blaspheme that worthy name by which ye are called? If ye fulfill the royal law according to the scriptures, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. But if ye respect, have respect of persons, ye commit sin, and ye are convinced of the law as transgressors. This was, this was simply a servant. This wasn't his brother. This wasn't his father. This was, this was a servant. This was somebody that was under him. Someone's financial status should not dictate the validity of their wisdom. I guess if you're talking to them about business things, okay. But if you're talking to them about spiritual things, just because they're well off, doesn't mean that they're going to give you good advice. I'm pretty sure if you go ask Bill Gates some good advice about the scripture, it's probably not going to be that great. Financial blessing does not indicate God's blessing. Um, we can see that all around us in the world. Now, it doesn't indicate that, you know, the lack of God's blessing either, for the record, but um, it doesn't indicate God's blessing. And so if we are not cautious to not be a respecter of persons, it'll, it'll start with small bias of, nah, I'm not going to listen to what this guy says. And then eventually it might turn into, well, I don't really want to share the scripture with them just because you know, they're just how they are. I don't know if I really want them in our church. And I, I have heard, I've heard many, many a pastor, I've part of, part of prison ministry with Brother Brian, where and Brian will tell you over and over that pastors will say, ah, prisoners that got out, no, no, we don't. We don't really want them anywhere near us. That's hard for me. I, I, so I go in and I see these men, and when they, when, they, when they get out, fellowship's pretty important for them. Having godly influence in their life is pretty important for them. And yet so often we become respecter of persons and say, eh, no, we'll just, we'll just keep, our, keep in our little circle and our click here. But it is important to have godly influences in our life. So Saul could have had the response of, who does this guy think he is? We're not going to see this person. But instead, he listens to him. So having godly influence in our life is a very important part about following God. Really, because we're human. 
we're, we, we are prone to fall away. Grab your hymn book. Turn, turn to page 26 for me. Very, very familiar song. Page number 26. Come thou fount. Look at verse number 3. It says, Oh, to grace, how great a debtor daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, or take and seal it. Seal it for the courts above. So the, the person that wrote this, the, the John, John Wyeth, I read a story about him um, quite a while ago, and he ended up falling away from the Lord. He, he, he wanted nothing to do with God. He became very agnostic, very atheist because, and looking back at that song, tells you, he says, I, I feel my heart, it's prone to wander. Now, men can fail, 100%. Influences in your life can let you down. But I will say that it is easier to stay on track for God if you have someone helping you that's there for you, that's pushing you along, that's encouraging you, that's challenging you, it, become, it becomes easier. Here, and hopefully we can get, all get to the day to where just us and God, our relationship alone is 100% enough and we need nothing more. And some of us are there right now, I guarantee it. But some aren't. And so if you're there, be the godly influence for the person that needs the help. A, a person that's newly saved in Christ is not going to have the mature relationship of someone that's been saved for 30 years. And it's just, it's not likely. And so be the godly influence in their life, just like this servant was here for Saul. Let's go back over to 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter number 9, get back to the text. Pro, or Proverbs 11.14 says, Where no counsel is, the people fall, but in the multitude of counselors there is safety. Um, I have in here a note about the, sto the story of Jonadab in 2 Samuel 13. We're not going to go there for, for time's sake. But 2 Samuel 13, you have the story of Jonadab um, with Amnon and Tamar. Amnon, being David's son, fell, fell sick, is how the Bible describes it, for his sister Tamar, his half-sister. And the, the Bible is very interesting how it words everything. Because when, when Amnon fell sick for his sister... He said, the Bible says he thought it hard to do anything to her. That's how, that's how the Bible words it. Amnon stopped. But then the Bible has the next verse, which is very, it's a very sad verse in the Bible. It says, but Amnon had a friend whose name was Jonadab. And Jonadab was a very subtle man. Through the lack of godly influence in his life, he ended up committing a heinous sin against God, and it cost him his life. All because... Bad influences in their life. Influences make a big difference. So here we can see Saul had a good influence in his life. We get down to verse number, verse number. Uh, let's go back to verse number six. Let's get read start from there again. And he said unto him, Behold, now there is a city, uh, in this city a man of God, and he is an honorable man, and he saith, Come, uh, cometh surely, sorry, and he, all that he that saith cometh surely to pass. Now let us go thither, peradventure he can show us our way that we should go. Then said Saul to his servant, But behold, if we go, what shall we bring the man? For the bread is spent in our vessels, and there is not a present to bring the man of God. What have we? And so that's what we're going to kind of spend the rest of the, the remainder of the time on, that thought. What have we? What have we? Saul says, We've, we've spent everything we have. We don't, the, the bread's gone. There's nothing left. What have we? And I think this is a good question that Christians ask often about church, about family, about, about many things, they say, what, what have we? What do I have to offer in order to make a difference for the cause of Christ? What have we? So Saul accepts the ideas of the servant, but it was a very important question for the servant. He says, what, what have we? So what have we to offer? So a couple of points that I thought about for our family. Many of us in here have unsaved loved ones. Many of us. Uh, every night, or every Friday night at RU, uh, one of the first things that goes on our prayer list 
is unsaved loved ones. And praise the Lord, we've seen some of those prayers answered. We've seen people come to the Lord, and I believe through our, through, through our prayers. We, we talk about, um, brother, brother Brian Gurley was here preaching and said, you know, I talked about soul winning and whatnot and said, you don't know who's been praying for that person for years. We, we prayed for some of those people for years, and they accepted Christ. Now, there's some that are still on our list that we're still praying for uh, every week. And we're going to trust that God's going to save them. God's going to bring just the right people in their life. But what about you? You have a testimony that nobody can argue with. Uh, I love testimonies because nobody can say anything. Like you go up to an atheist and you tell him your testimony. You say, well, I just want to tell you what God's done in my life. What are they going to say? Well, God didn't do that. What? You, you, you're not inside me. You don't know what's going on in my head. This, this, this change happened because of the love of God and his grace in my life. I was a sinner. I, I did wrong. I, I, was, I was on a path of destruction and, and, and death. And God came in my heart. He, he changed my life. Jesus Christ, I, I saw the love, compassion that he had, and it changed me. I accepted Christ as my Savior. And now, because of that, I'm, I'm going a different direction. I repented of my sin. Nobody can argue with that. <laughs> and so you have your testimony that you can take to your family. So when you say, you know, what have we? And you're at a, you know, a Thanksgiving dinner with your family, your testimony goes a long way. My family calls me, uh, so the most of my, my mom's side of my family is unsaved. They call me the white sheep rather than the black sheep. Um, <laughs> just because of the fact that, yeah, what they do at, at, at their family get-togethers. And so um, it's one of those things where your testimony can affect your family unlike, unlike my testimony could. If they see a change in your life or they see how you act, that's going to be a whole lot, lot larger impact than how I act. They don't know me from you know, Joe Schmo. And so your testimony is a big thing when it comes to your, your family. So here I have um, 1 Peter 3 written down. Uh, this is obviously specific about wives and, subject, um, wives and husbands uh, with an unsaved wife, but I, I believe it applies for an unsaved brother or sister. It says, Likewise, you lives be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, that they, all, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. While they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear, whose adorning, let it not be a part of the outward, the plating of hair and of the wearing of gold, or putting out of apparel, but let it be the, in, the hidden man of the heart, and that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek, quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price." The woman's testimony is what won the husband. That, that's what God said. Peter said, do this. Have a good testimony. Treat him how, how you're supposed to treat him according to this book. Brother, uh, Brother Gurley preached on being good to people. Just, just doing, doing what the book says to do, and as opportunities present themselves, taking the opportunities. With your family, do what the book says to do. Show the testimony. Show your life. Show that you're a changed individual and live by that. And when the opportunity presents itself, take the opportunity. We talked about in uh, TFM today that obviously we, we are not a Calvinistic church in any way, shape, or form. We believe that Christ died for, for all, that his blood was shed for every person in the world, and that it's a person's responsibility to accept the free gift of salvation. We believe that. But I think sometimes we act Calvinistic in the fact that we don't go spread the gospel like we should. You talk to, well, you talk to some Calvinists, and they'll say that, you know, well, we don't go, I, I don't need to go door knocking because they're going to get, by, by God's grace, they're going to be saved. If we don't believe that, why is it that we act like that sometimes? Oh, well, if my, if my family's supposed to get saved, they'll get saved. Okay. Don't act like it. T -t take the word to them. Start with your conversation. Start with your testimony. And as that opportunity approaches, present the gospel to them. What about in our church? What about our church? Obviously, we all have talents. We all have different talents that we can use. Um, 1 Corinthians 12. Time's sake, we're not going to go there. I don't know which clock is right. That's it. Okay, not this one. Um, I, I've been looking at that one the whole time, so I have less time than I thought. Anyhow, 
Um, so 1 Corinthians 12 talks about the body, the body of Christ and how the church is to work together. Um, and Bobby actually preached a message on this not too long ago, talking about the different aspects of the body. And every one of us have talents and a responsibility in the body of Christ in order for that to function correctly. And if we don't use that, if we come and say, what have we? Well, you have something. You have something. Some of, you, some of us have, have multiple somethings that we can use. And we ought to be doing everything that we can in this body of Christ, in this church, in this local body of believers to make sure that this runs smoothly in a way that will honor and glorify Christ, play that, a way that uplifts him, a way that um, uh, l- praises his name, a way that when somebody comes in, they see a difference. But that's not going to happen if we say, what have we? And, we? and we don't do anything with it. Because we all have something, but are we willing to actually use it? God's entrusted you with certain things. And how have you used the things that God's entrusted you with? What about, what about our pastor? What, what have we? What can we offer our pastor? I promise you our pastor loves when people pray for him. Prayer, by all means, saying an uplifting word to him and uh, you know, give him, giving him 10 grand, I'm sure he's going to love all that. He loves prayer. He loves prayer. And he needs prayer. You look at some of the stuff that our pastor's gone through in the last few years. I think our pastor has an amazing heart, an amazing passion. Um, His vision, I I think, is incredible for our church. I don't think Satan's happy about it. And I think Satan's going to do everything he can to hinder this Zonka Bible project, 100%. You can't say Satan's going to sit back on the sidelines and go, "Ah, we'll just see what happens. I, I don't see that happening. We ought to be praying for our pastor 1 Timothy 5.17 says, Let the elders that rule well be counted of double, uh, worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in the word and doctrine. Our pastor labors in word and doctrine. He spends hours studying, pre- um, preparing for, for standing up here and presenting what, what God has shown him in his word. Uh, Brother Leonard said this morning, there's something about just our pastor not being here. And it's true. I, I, I love hearing everybody else preach, but I, our pastor's my favorite preacher. He, he is. And so we need to pray for him. What have we for our pastor? We have prayer. And then finally for God. God, if we look at God and say, God, what have we? And go ahead and turn over to Matthew 22, and we'll end here. Matthew 22, verse number 37. Very, very familiar verse. I would say, Jesus saith unto him, oh, sorry, let's go to the 36, I apologize. Uh, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Verse 37, Jesus saith unto him, said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. We have our heart, soul, and mind that we can give to God. If you give God your heart, all of the other things that we've talked about just fall in place. If you have a true love for him, a true caring for God, I understand that love is, is an, a conscious action. There's some emotion that will come along with it as well, though. I think we can all agree on that. If you can get emotional about God, about your love for him, I, I think your life will, your prayer life, your Bible reading, they'll be a little different for you. Uh, to have an emotional response rather than, well, I'm going to pray today because I know that uh, God loves me and I, I know that I love him. And by all means, there are going to be days in our life where we don't feel the emotional response of, of, of a great, happy, fluffy feeling. But the days that we do, let's, let's take advantage of that. Let's use that. Let's give God our heart. Let's give him our soul. Let's give him our mind. Study on him you, intellectually. So if you got, the, in recap, kind of conclusion here, if you want God's will, do what's right now. Do what, you're know, do what you know you're supposed to be doing right now and let him reveal his will to you as you do the, the simple stuff, as you find the donkeys, if you will. Do that now. Have godly influences to help. Be very picky about your influences, but have godly influences to help. And then finally, the question isn't so much what have we, because we have a lot. 
Are we willing to use it for him? If everyone wants to stand to their feet, we'll bow our head, close our eyes, we'll pray. Pastor Jerry, if you want to come. Father, I love you so much. God, I thank you for your word. Thank you for this example of Saul just being obedient, willing to give of himself. God, I pray that you would please put that same desire in our hearts and our lives. Help us to find your will simply by doing your will. Help us to have a personal relationship with you, one that goes beyond an everyday chore. But Lord, that there's, there's, there's a love to it. And God, when we ask ourselves the question, what have we? Show us what we have. And then give us the courage to use it for your honor and your glory. Lord, I love you. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Stephen. Amen. If you bow your head and close your eyes, we'll have